Hello and welcome to GameSack. Let's check out some games that are playable in English thanks to the community and no thanks to the companies that originally developed and published these titles. The retro community is amazing in so many ways and this is just about one example of that. Now I'm going to focus on games where understanding the language is a big part of the gameplay. Well, except for one, but that one's just too awesome not to show, but still, most of these games are really awesome. Let's start. First up is Aconcagua for the PlayStation 1 from Sony. This is a point-and-click adventure. You start out on a plane, which soon explodes, leaving you stranded in the Andes Mountains, and you need to work your way down the mountain known as Aconcagua. The plane crashed. You use the on-screen cursor to point where your character should go and what he or she should interact with. It's extremely odd at first, and I wonder why they chose this method instead of just directly controlling your characters. They don't always go exactly where you want or behave like you need them to. Still, you do get kind of used to it, and it ends up working for the game. Anyway, you quickly find other survivors and travel together in a pack. You can switch to any of the other characters at any time with the shoulder buttons. Each person has their own items and skills. For example, only one of you can speak Spanish, so you need to use her if you find anyone else who speaks in Espanol. One guy is an engineer with a tool set. The main guy has gloves, which means he can climb certain cliffs. You need to use all of your items and cunning to get past each area in a manner that kind of reminds me of The Lost Vikings if you've ever played that. It's a rather clever concept for a game like this. The game will prompt you to save once in a while, which is usually after you get past an area. Yes, sometimes you are in danger and you can get hurt, hence the life bars that everyone has, so be careful. There are even some pseudo action scenes like here where I need to hook this rope from the helicopter that's attacking us to this wreckage. I keep trying and trying, but she won't do it. She just keeps walking away. Needless to say, it can be pretty frustrating. Don't worry, I kept trying and I eventually got it. You're just supposed to automatically know where the cursor needs to be when you press the circle button. The translation was done by Hilltop. All of the voices were already in English, well, except for those in Spanish. But now we have subtitles for everything. They don't always match up perfectly with what's being said, and Hilltop says this was due to technical limitations. It's a helicopter. It's the sound of a helicopter. Sometimes the text will shrink a lot for seemingly no reason. This must be another one of those technical limitations. So this isn't a translation that one would mistake as being official, but it's plenty good enough to be playable. Mostly because of all the non-voice dialogue and other text is translated, which is far more important. As a whole, I very much feel this one is worth playing through, and sometimes the puzzles will stump you. Can you complete this game without using a guide? It's too bad that this one wasn't released outside of Japan in its own time, but at one point a North American release was planned. Be sure to give this excellent two-disc title a go. This is Planet Laika from Enix on the original PlayStation, or Laika if you prefer. This adventure game was developed by Quintet. You may know them from their first game, ActRaiser. As a result, this is pretty much identical to ActRaiser, well, except for the ways that it's different, which is every way. You think that was a strange thing for me to say? Well, it's nowhere near as strange as this game. It starts out with a bunch of furries on their way to Mars. They call themselves humans, so why are they furries? Well, okay, get this. Basically, Earth and Mars made a pact. Earth surrendered their faces to the Martians, but when the Martians got the faces, they started dying. The Earthlings got dog faces as a result. Yeah. This doesn't explain why our furry protagonists have tails, though. Even the sound design is weird. Supposedly there have been monsters appearing on Mars and rumors are that the planet is doomed. This rumor is a big hindrance to the terraforming that you want to do. You are sent in to identify the source of the rumor. Anyway, Mars is naturally evil and everyone is going nuts and they're affected by the evil face which seems to be a purple cloud. You have four distinct personalities. Naturally all have different abilities and you can sometimes switch between them to access further areas. There are even battles in here, and they can be weird as well. You need to move your little floating orb back and forth to repel the enemy's floating orbs. Doesn't this look fun? 
As you've already surmised by watching the gameplay so far, the game is stitched together with many different scenes displayed at different angles, Resident Evil style. Unfortunately, switching from screen to screen is quite slow, unlike Resident Evil. The game doesn't use tank controls though, you just press where you want your character to walk. Fortunately, the game supports analog controls. The translation was done by Cargoden, and it seems to be pretty good for the most part. There is a fair amount of swearing here, so you want to make sure to hide your innocent children. It can often be hard to discern what you need to do next, even with this English translation. Like, where the hell is the exhaust tower? No clues are given. Sometimes, the text boxes disappear too fast before I've read them without me prompting them to do so. I'm not sure if that's the fault of the original game or the translation. I can see why this title was never released outside of Japan. It's one of those that's so weird is funny type of things, though I think the developer was going for something that's actually deep and meaningful. When it comes down to it though, I had a hard time maintaining interest, but perhaps it's something that you'd enjoy trying out. This next one is an awesome RPG on the Saturn, and who wouldn't love that? Granted, it did come out in English on the PlayStation, but you know what, I'm gonna talk about it anyway. This is Grandia from Game Arts on the Saturn, or Grandia if you prefer. The way you say it is the correct way, naturally. This RPG from the makers of the Lunar Games, or Lunar if you prefer, was released in 1997, only in Japan. At least this version anyway. It was built from the ground up for the Saturn. The English patch comes to us from Trekkies Unite 118. Just a heads up, most of the footage you see here isn't the latest patch as I noticed several updates after I captured a good portion of this game. This is mostly based on the English text that the game got when it was localized for the PlayStation. While you can play this game there or remastered for HD, it's always fun to play something on the console it was originally intended for. And in many ways, the Saturn game is better than the PlayStation version, even some of the graphics. It certainly sold a lot more than the PlayStation version did in Japan. Still, I knew the Saturn game would never come out in North America, so I imported it when it was first available in Japan, hoping to brute force my way through it. That turned out to be very tough, as even getting out of the first town was perplexing at best. The online guides of the time were absolutely no help at all, so I never even made it out back then. Yeah, pretty sad, I know. I never bothered with the PlayStation version when it came out. But with this translation, I was able to make it out of the town and progress with the game right on my very own Saturn. The battles aren't random, as you can see the enemies roaming around on the screen. The battles feature a timer bar, but fortunately the battles freeze to let you make your selection unlike some games. This is much appreciated and helps make the battles feel satisfying. The battles have an extremely fast pace compared to Game Art's previous RPGs, which were the Lunar games. This helps it feel like your time isn't being wasted and it really cuts back on the frustration level when you get into a battle. You know that it'll soon be done and you can go back to exploring the game. It also makes grinding a little bit easier to deal with. Although the screen zooms in and out and pans all over the place during a battle, they're still fun and they don't become a bother. Unfortunately, the game gives you very little experience and it takes a while to level up. Regardless, the enemies never feel overpowering. You rotate the world's camera with the L and R shoulder buttons. The 3D view of the game makes everything seem much larger. The towns, for example, can be a bit confusing as everything looks similar, but you can zoom out and see that it's really not that large. You can't do this outside of town though. Well, there are blue markers which will let you do this, but only in these locations and you can't pan around. As I said earlier, the English text here is based on the PlayStation version, so it's not really a fan translation per se. But a fan put the text in here and I wanted to talk about this game anyway. As a translation, it's fine and certainly feels official without any typos that I've noticed. Older versions of the patch had some formatting errors like this. As you can see, the text goes outside of the box. But the newer patches fix this. However, I don't think that this is a banana. What do I know though? The newest patch calls it a deaf seed. Oh wait, no, it's also a banana. The patch claims that it removes the censoring that was in the PlayStation port, but I couldn't tell you what that censoring was since I haven't played through the PlayStation version. The graphics are excellent for the Saturn with great use of colors and polygons that look pretty clean for their day. The game will slow down a bit when things get complex, but it doesn't detract from the enjoyment I'm experiencing. 
The music by Noriyuki Iwidari isn't bad at all, and sometimes it's actually excellent. This is a great and honestly rather addictive RPG. I'm glad I can finally play through it on my Saturn like the gods intended. Here's Live Alive from Square on the Super NES, or like it's written here, Live a 3 Vidge. Yeah, I know this is available in English for all the modern platforms, I mean except for the Xbox. But now you can finally play it on the console it was designed for in 1994. Actually you could do this since 2008 when Aeon Genesis offered this English patch. Anyway, this is an RPG that offers 9 different chapters, each completely different than the last. You can play seven of these chapters in any order right from the start. Each chapter has battles and these work more or less the same across the entire game. Move around on a grid and choose moves similar to a strategy RPG, only it's timer based since this is square. The timers are all invisible though. You can use your special moves seemingly without limit and you gain all of your life back if you win a battle. Certain chapters have their own touches, like the ability to make the ninja invisible to be stealthy to avoid battles, or this kid's ability to read minds to help advance the story. The same game engine is used in each chapter and they all have a similar look other than the different time periods that they're set in. For whatever reason, an illustrator is credited at the beginning of each chapter, and they're the only ones who get credit there. Not sure what they illustrated as the game is full of very basic, tiny, but still easy on the eyes pixel art. The music is excellent when it plays, with some fantastic sound quality. You don't have enough save slots for each individual chapter. What you want to do is complete a chapter and then move on to the next using that same save slot. For this review, I sampled each of them one by one. Because of this, I think I ended up not liking a few of the chapters as much as I otherwise would have. For example, the sci-fi one is very slow to start and nothing really happens for a while. I was eager to start capturing footage for the next chapter. The wrestling one, I died almost right away. The western one, I died even faster. I think if I instead took my time with each chapter, they would have been much more enjoyable. That said, I really enjoyed what I played of the ninja and mecha chapters. The translation is rather typical for Aeon Genesis. It's all quite readable, but their typical personality bleeds into it sometimes, for better or for worse. There are a couple of technical issues, like the graphics here being too close to the text, and the occasional graphical corruption on the screen that usually disappears quickly. One thing that's super cool is that each chapter has its very own unique font. Very own and unique, I suppose that's a bit redundant, isn't it? All the fonts are quite readable, and I think this is an awesome touch. This is a good one to try out if you're curious about getting the modern remake or if you just prefer to do all of your gaming in the past. Remember Shadow Squadron on the Sega 32X? Of course you do. Everyone knows what this game is. You fly around in 3D space and shoot things. It's actually pretty fun. Well, as you may or may not know, it got a sequel on the Saturn called Stellar Assault SS. I'm sure the SS probably stands for Shadow Squadron. Actually, no, it stands for Sega Saturn since the 32X game was called Stellar Assault in Japan as well. The entire game is letterboxed. Fortunately, you can change the color of the border if you want. But let's just zoom in for the rest of this video. So anyway, this one has been translated by Lacquerware, whom you may remember from their insanely awesome Bulk Slash translation also on the Saturn. While there wasn't a lot of text here to translate, they did localize all of the spoken dialogue into English and there is a ton of it. We're talking nearly an hour of voice, no pun intended. So this... <laughs> Now sounds like this. This marks the first field up of the illustrious Joint Space Command. Let's move out. Mission area coordinates confirmed. 
The sound quality is excellent, and the quality of the acting is definitely a little better than most localized games of the time. It's really impressive how they were able to keep the normal background sounds and music in the full motion video scenes and replace only the voice. That's true professional localization power right there. The attack had unified us, bringing an end to eons of conflict over ethnic and religious divides. The new voices aren't just in the FMV scenes, but often during the gameplay as well, where the sound quality remains excellent. All units return fire. Don't die. This project took them around 16 months to complete and uses nine volunteer voice actors. They even updated the loading screens and menu text. As for the game, you still fly around in 3D space and shoot things. It's fun, just like its predecessor was. Lacquerware even added support for the Saturn mission stick, and I jump at any chance to use this. It controls perfect and naturally with the mission stick, but it also supports the Saturn analog controller. If you don't have either of these, don't fret too much because it's still a lot of fun if you enjoy these types of games. There are 17 total missions, some of which are hidden. Although it says that you have three continues, they changed it so that it's unlimited. The counter will never go down to two, one, or no continues. Just be sure not to let that timer run out or you will get a game over. And when you do continue, you're forced to sit through the entire mission introduction again, some of which can be quite long. I really wish there were a way to skip these if you've already seen it, but no such luck. And although you save your game between each stage, if you want to beat the game, you have to do it all in one sitting. You can go into the trace mode and replay any mission you've completed, but if you want to advance to the next stage, you need to start from mission one each time. A game like this is too long for one sitting, so I'm afraid that's just not going to happen for me. Though I guess you could leave the game on pause since it offers those unlimited continues and if you're not playing the game on a spinning disc, you're not wearing down your Saturn. I personally recommend using the Satiator. With the game being like it is, flying around 3D space and all, it pretty much goes without saying that most of the visuals are going to be dark and empty with very little pizzazz. It does get better the further you get into the game though with some brighter colors and more interesting stuff. There's an interlaced mode in this game for some reason, but you won't gain any more resolution if you engage it. So turn it on if you want your screen to jiggle on your CRT for no reason. This game is loads of fun to play and the English voices really enhance that enjoyment. You owe it to yourself to try this out right now. Well, actually, if you could wait till the episode is over, I would appreciate it. It really does feel like a true high quality official localization, just like Bulk Slash does. This is Solar Probe Umbrella. Our shields are nearly sapped. Please send help. Ah! Oh, oh. Not good. Move it. This next series, well, it's not really a series, but I kind of. Anyway, it's something that Sega really seems to love given how much the main character pops up as a cameo in their other media. Anyway, now it's in English on the console that it was designed for the second time. This is Rent a Hero number one from Sega on the Dreamcast. I reviewed the Xbox version, which also never left Japan a little over a hundred episodes ago, and playing this version is almost exactly the same. The Xbox One was an official translation that was almost complete and it was intended for an actual release in English, but that never happened. The Dreamcast version here, which the Xbox game is based on, was translated by Vincent N.L. To his credit, he and his team seem to have done an excellent job. This one mostly uses the English text from the Xbox translation, but it restores a lot of text that was missing from the leaked Xbox version. Like this lady who has a few more things to say about the batteries that she loves so much. They even went in and touched up a few of the 3D models here and there. This is definitely an amazing effort. Basically, you're a dude who rents a hero costume that gives you more power. You use it to perform good deeds like delivering food or maybe handing out flyers. This game sure knows how to get a player's heart pounding with excitement. Actually, just the opposite. Seriously, the game itself is fairly clumsy. There's no analog control in this game at all, nor is there any camera control. The pace is slow and there's very little excitement. You're often not even sure what you're supposed to do or where to go. You'll spend a lot of time running around talking to people again and again, desperately trying to trigger the game to advance to the next extremely mundane task. The game seriously could use an on-screen map. 
I spent a lot of time running around here looking for the mayor who I know is by the train station. I'll be damned if I can find the train station in all of this blandness. It was just easier to go back to the previous city where I could find the train station and then take the train back to the one where I came from. Oh, there he is. Why is the train station hidden here? Once the game starts to pick up after about an hour, it still doesn't even get that exciting. You often have to fight, and these battles are just as clumsy as everything else. I often want to punch, but end up just grabbing the enemy and throwing them instead. It's supposed to be a lighthearted game, and it is, but it's just so unpolished. I mean, look at the sky here. Yeah, that's not right. And when you go into or out of anywhere, you're walking into a black void. That, the weird controls, and the bad camera make me feel like this game is unfinished. The Xbox version was the same way. The graphics are sharp, and they run at 60 frames per second, but they're mostly pretty bland and void of life. Everything feels extremely empty. The music is okay when it plays, and the sound effects are perhaps a touch below average. It's fine to play through if you've never done so before, but playing it again after that? Yeah, it's just not holding up very well for me. The original game on the Mega Drive wasn't even all that special, but Sega seems to love the IP for whatever reason. Anyway, now it's in English on the Dreamcast if you're interested in trying it out, and I'd recommend it over the Xbox game since it's more of a complete translation. This one is called Valholian, and it's from Dat Japan for the Saturn. The translation was done by Stardust Crusaders, Aishisha, and Paul Met. This is a strategy RPG that's exclusive to the console. I like that it's 2D because at the time everyone was making their strategy RPGs 3D, so this is refreshing. As you'd imagine, you move your pieces around the map and then choose to fight an enemy if you're close enough. When this happens, it moves to a 3D perspective where polygon models battle it out. Often, a counterattack will take place. This is all nice and good, but when there's a bunch of enemies to kill, it can get a little slow and tedious. Fortunately, you can change the animation mode to fast, and this just quickly shows animations on a 2D map, greatly speeding up the gameplay. There's also a manual animation mode, but this seems to just put the battles back into 3D, not sure what's manual about it. If you know, well, then let me know. Unfortunately, the developers didn't have a thought in their heads about the difficulty, as early on you face a ton of enemies with just three people and very low HP and no items to get any of it back. You can restore some of it using secret arts, but you can't use this more than a couple times per character. You can save at any time during a battle though, and then reload it right at that turn if you mess up. I recommend doing this. However, the battles are long and this is just gonna make it longer, but you're more likely to win. Unfortunately, I couldn't stop myself from dying and still haven't made it past the second battle. It probably gets better once you have a bunch of characters. I mean, I assume that happens. It just seems that this game wants you to peace out before it ever does happen. Not really the best first impression. Maybe I'll load up my save and try again in a few years, who knows. The translation is very well done, however, though the dialogue is pretty dry. That means it's probably fairly faithful to the original text, if that's what you want. But they seem to get everything, making sure nothing anywhere was hidden beneath a language barrier. As a game, I think I'll stick with Shining Force 1 and 2 on the Genesis if I want to play a 2D strategy RPG. I want to mention Drift King 97 for the Saturn really quick, which has been translated by Malenko to become Tokyo Highway Battle 97. This is a racing game where you try to beat your rivals on a few different highways in Tokyo. It plays fine and it uses the analog controller, but honestly, these types of racing games aren't really my jam. I just want more variety in my racing games. However, the full motion videos have been subtitled and they give you hints on how you should play. Not only that, but the rivals you raced against have also been translated. And one of those rivals is Craig Stadler. Damn you, Craig, you always find your way into my show. 
He's a fairly decent driver. He knows the looping highways of Tokyo pretty well if I do say so myself. In fact, I think he's driven on these roads many times before. And of course, if you beat him, so yeah, it's a decent game with some good music and a smooth frame rate that's now in English on the Saturn if you like the Tokyo Highway Battle games. Dr. Slump from Bandai on the PlayStation. This is an adventure action game. That's right, not action adventure. I actually just made that up because the emphasis here is definitely more on the adventure. You play a robot who's a very excitable little girl who's just been brought to life. You don't know what anything is, but everything makes you extremely excited and happy. You learn things just by watching them, which is how you learn how to jump, punch, slide, and everything else that you'll eventually be able to do. You travel from scene to scene by way of the go sign that's in each area. Using these becomes a bit complex, as you can only get to certain places from other specific areas, but it's nothing that's going to make your brain seize. During the adventure parts, you'll talk to lots of people, and you'll need to accomplish some rather mundane tasks, but the game is pretty lighthearted and keeps things peppy, definitely more so than Rent-A-Hero. You don't have any control of the camera at all, but it doesn't really matter for the adventure scenes. Eventually, you'll get to some action stages. These are quite a bit tougher as you can only take so many hits, and it can be more challenging than you might think to avoid getting damaged. You can't control the camera here either, and because of that, it can be tough to judge the depth on where the platforms you need to land on are. I often fell when I thought I was safe. The camera having a mind of its own in these segments can make some parts of it pretty frustrating. Your attacks are also a touch slow for these segments, and your reach is limited, but if you die, you can continue as much as you'd like. And yes, there are even boss fights. Then you're back to the adventure part, which again is the meat of the game. You'll keep unlocking more abilities and gaining new powers. One thing I thought was funny is that you have to earn the ability to remap your controller buttons. It's not there right at the start. Fortunately, they're set up pretty well right from the get-go. You collect pink poops for whatever reason in the adventure scenes, and you can even get gold poops in the action scenes. Lucky you! The translation was done by Hilltop, and it totally makes the game playable. There are a couple of extremely minor technical issues again, like some of the text being hidden behind the advancement cursor. There's also a part where your teacher invites you into her house, and then after that she invites you to take a bath with her, which is kind of unnecessary and creepy. This probably isn't the translator's fault, at least I hope it's not, but it's something that would likely not fly in a professional translation. Speaking of that, the game definitely isn't geared towards children despite the fact that you control a young girl robot. For example, there's a whole thing about a nudie mag that you find and you show it to a bunch of different people. By the way, Hilltop also changed the character model to more represent how she appears in the manga. There's a translation-only patch that leaves the retail model intact, and this is how she looks in that version. Personally, I think I like the retail model better. But if you're a fan of the manga, then you will no doubt appreciate the changes made to keep it more in line with that. The graphics are colorful, but the variable frame rate can get pretty choppy sometimes. The music is light and happy, though it can sometimes start to feel a bit repetitive. Overall, this is a fun game to play despite a few weird things here and there. You gotta be careful in those action scenes. And there you go, a bunch of games that are definitely worth checking out in English. Now, if you didn't know, I make these episodes pretty far in advance. So today it's May 14th as I'm shooting this, even though this episode isn't scheduled to be released until July 9th, I think it is. Check your calendars, hopefully that's true. I say this because some of these games could have had updates to their English patches to make them even better than what I showed here. And a lot of you are probably asking, why do you make your episode so far in advance? Well, it's a good question, but it basically really cuts down on the stress. You know, I'm able to take some time off if I need to or work on other non-video game related projects. That's right, I have a life outside of video games. And, you know, it's just basically make sure I have an episode ready to go all the time just in case something happens. 
But anyway, let me know what you thought about the games I talked about in this episode, and in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Hi, welcome to another episode. This is where I play my games. That's right. This is where the magic happens, right here. I have my TV and I have some games. I play games here like... Like socket? on the Genesis. I play lots of games here. I play games like Soldies. That's not all. Oh no. I also play games like uh Bart Simpson. Well actually I don't really play this one because it's not very good. <laughs> Oh, but look what I found in this place. Five dollars. I'm gonna keep that right now. Well that's my game room. I hope I hope you enjoyed seeing a look behind the screens. That's it. The end. Bye.